think David really needs no introduction for this talk, but maybe I'll just say that, um, you know, super facility is a, a very important strategic priority for us, and David has been working on the actual super facility project for a few years. Uh, it's Mac and his work with Peter Dennis and others. And um, I think there are some aspects of acquiring data, which we in the NHP Center typically don't pay attention to. So I think we're going to elaborate on some of that today. Yeah. Well, th thank you for about it. Um, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on uh, much at all, really, but um, in something like super facilities, there's so much uh, so much to do that um, there are a lot of different angles to, uh, to approach things from. So this is a very much a gen generalist sort of overview, looking at data acquisition systems and computing. Um, I, I, I encourage you to think of the term data acquisition system, which I'll define a little bit here in a pretty generalized way. Um, if you need any convincing of that, um, look away from maybe the project that you're deeply enmeshed in at the, you know, 15 or other projects that, that NERSC can see us are involved in. And there are many, many great projects, but their commonalities are, are can be difficult to find. So, you know, this is a, a talk about the intersectionality rather than um, about the specificity of a given DAC. So it's, I'd start off with one that you could find at a garage sale. Um, this is a, a, a USB uh, uh, DAC. And for those of you that don't do electronics or are familiar with the difference, just a verbal acronym for a data acquisition system. Um, so you could play around with this one without uh, you know, safety training or a team of 20 people or anything like that. And it takes a detector, uh, you know, a signal from a detector and produces data from it. Um, that, that is that we, we often get bits that come out and we have some control over how those bits are, are, uh, are formed. Um, use a camera and a microphone down here, but you can of course think of better things than that. So let's start with another DAC, the eyeball. Another one that we know, um, you know, is that this is a, uh, data acquisition system sort of, you know, formed over a lot of time uh, and uh, takes in photons, a remarkably small number of photons here, you know, does some sort of uh, processing that I won't describe in any more uh, ways other than it might get philosophically entangled about what we're really talking about right here. But interestingly, when the optic nerves first meet, um, and, and even before that, um, the, the data is, uh, the, the signal is being manipulated, not just carried. And so, you know, some of the things that you can think, what can you do when you first have parallax between two detectors? You know, you can compute angles, depths, and things like that. So, you know, this is a biologically inspired example of kind of a end-to-end -end system that takes in photons and gets something useful uh, out of it. And remarkably, you know, it, ha it all happens pretty quickly. So to add to the pantheon of um, rather remarkable data acquisition systems, um, I, if anybody knows a workaround to this glitch, let me know. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, the, this is a, a DAC that is remarkable, uh, not maybe as much as the, the you know, man mammalian vision system, but uh, pretty remarkable overall, in that it can take in a tremendous lot of data and uh, produce, under, you know, get towards understanding, reducing that data by a very substantial factor. And so, um, you know, this deck, this deck, you're not going to find it at a garage sale, um, but it, it, uh, it's worth thinking about um, how it got to be, you know, and um, it got to be by uh, a large number of people over a large number of time making a lot of conscientious decisions about what should or shouldn't happen inside here. And um, so, you know, that, that begs the question in a, in a way, you know, if this is one EOS team, that is paving uh, a road for data to come to our center, you know, what do the other roads look like? <clears throat> in particular, how many, you know, this question ask yourself if you're in the, in the nurse data areas, how many nurse EOS teams can we expect to, to pull this off, right? To do something like this where, where they have done enough uh, of the, the, the front loading sort of work that, that when the data arrives here, um, we're not just catching up, right? So, um, this is a compliment to the high energy physics community. It's also a recognition that um, this was a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of people. This is not a, a, a small project. So, and if you have questions, let me know. We can stop along the way. 
So the eyeball and have pretty, pretty uh, amazing data uh, acquisition systems. Um, all of these posits, this is a kind of our standard matrix of uh, super facility partners and, um, you know, whether they call that their system a DAC or not, you know, we are there acquiring data and, and kind of bringing it to us in some ways and across a remarkable, um, remarkably uh, diverse set of phys physical mechanisms to get the data to us. Um, and, you know, again, some questions to ask about how is the data going to get here and in what form and, and things like that is, um, and this is a question I don't know the answer to, but many people in the audience kind of have their own piecemeal knowledge is how many of these devices, facilities, you know, have really planned, you know, for, uh, for HPC, say. And, you know, uh, I don't mean to say that HPC planning is something that people need to target us directly, but, you know, the basic issues, you know, bandwidth, you know, the, the time to process the data. Um, if you, you know, crank up the machine to the next level, are you going to produce a million files that you're going to have to deal with? Those types of things. Um, these are really common issues that, that, that can go unresolved without planning. Um, but um, to the degree that we can think about the, the, the uh, mechanisms and devices that are going to be bringing to, data to us in the future, the earlier we get involved, the better. Because, uh, yeah. Okay, so taking away the standard matrix of, of uh, you know, existing established DOE partners, you know, uh, there's likely to be a lot more. And, and, um, and we might want to think about uh, those as far ahead of time as we can. And, you know, one, uh, I, I won't talk about it a lot in this talk, but one motivating example in those, uh, in, uh, along that lines of planning that, that um, I'd say pretty much anybody, any, any staff here could do, is that if you're working on a proposal, you know, for somebody who's saying, hey, I want to build this amazing new thing, if you have some sensibilities about data planning, one thing you could say is, you know, hey, can we work on a data management plan together? Or, hey, go talk to David or Debbie or, you know, somebody in, 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 in one of these groups, you know, to, to build a data management plan uh, uh, for those devices. So um, what are these things? This is a cryo-electron microscope. These are two people. I think it's, I'm, I'm going to talk some about people uh, in this talk because, um, like I said, if you're, if you're, you know, natural selection and you've got a million years, you can, you, you can make a pretty good DAC. If you're in the military and you want to fly a spy satellite and drop film out of the atmosphere and catch it, you know, there's, you can build amazing data acquisition systems with enough resources. But realistically, they were talking about two people and this, this machine here. Maybe more than that, but think small. Uh, think small and think cheap. Uh, this is something that would have been a uh, serial number zero. Uh, this is a, 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 a detectress, uh, a electron detector for the most famous for X rays uh, at the end of beam lines. So um, that was a very hard to use type of capability not too many years ago. Now, if you go to the ALS users meeting, the vendors have a, have a table there where they want to sell you these things, right? Um, and so that's all well and good. Um, but again, how much data planning is there? Uh, that's going into there. And if, if you know somebody at ALS or anywhere that says, oh yeah, I'm going to buy a hundred of these things and we're going to set them up and do this amazing, uh, you know, uh, you know, synthetic aperture or whatever sort of thing that, uh, that uh, they probably are not going to have the data come out just right uh, all at the beginning. So producing data is getting easier. This is a, a, a cryo electron microscope, really big, uh, kind of getting bigger, uh, you know, some quantum uh, devices, uh, and these are things that you would find at the end of beam lines that are increasingly uh, commodity and, and, uh, and off the shelf. Um, oh, yeah. So, so will these things talk to HPC if needed? And um, do, they, do they need to talk to HPC? So a couple things to rule out, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I bring this up pretty frequently in, in meetings and other contexts is that um, simplicity, you know, uh, it can be a, a, a terrible way to get started with, uh, with things, right? So if you, if you want to say, um, let's, let's make a solution that works for everything, and then, you know, this is going to fly into all these DACs, I, I, would, I would challenge that that's, uh, that's hopeless, right? And that instead, um, you know, the motivations to connect to HPC need to be there in the first place. 
um, and the the uh, the, uh, the capabilities and resources you know to to make the connection need to be there too. So this slide is mostly uh, intended to encourage people to think about uh, detectors and and devices that are not yet on our on our roadmap and um, when they might be, how big their teams might be, and whether or not we're allowed to work with them. You know, if they're in in the DOE uh, Office of Science mission. Um, so the, the title of this talk is Opportunities and Challenges, and this is kind of the skeleton of that. Um, and, and it's not meant to be exhaustive, um, but you know, these are two opportunities that I think are, are recyclable. Um, and uh, I, I know they're recyclable because I've, I've, you know, I've seen parts of it. So the first is, is this, that um, uh, if you're, this is in the context of uh, EOS, right? If you can identify a use case where adding HPC allows uniquely new science or some sort of breakthrough in productivity, a, a, a burst, that's a good motivation to connect that device to, to HPC. So breakthrough is relative, means different things to different people, but um, if you can convince a DOE program manager that it's a breakthrough, then it's a breakthrough, right? So, uh, you know, what, what does that look like? Um, uh, in a couple of cases, it could be, you know, strong argument towards um, we couldn't do this work unless we have the, this bigger computer. Um, we would be really slow at doing this work unless we had a bigger computer, a lot of them. So second is, is really about technology development, which says that, you know, um, the, the uh, externalized cost of messy data devices is in part due to the inability of the people making the devices to provision and realize those costs, right? So if the development happens next to a supercomputer, then they can be sloppy for a while and then figure out how to take that slop out of the device, right? And um, so first and co-design are sort of these two uh, reasons for, for doing this that I'd bring up. So any questions? Okay. Um, if you have other opportunities, I'd be interested in hearing about them. Um, Many challenges, many challenges. Uh, ignore all the challenges where there is no opportunity, right? Like you can imagine a million things that could be hard, right? But if there's no guiding opportunity behind it, then you know that, that's not there. But in the cases where people are beating down our door and saying, hey, we really need to use NERSC, what are some of the issues that, that come up? Team size, one that I already mentioned, um, lack of vendor HPC integration, lack of forethought, you know, in, in, a, in a way. Um, terrible richness of file formats, um, each with their own kind of performance, uh, proprietariness issues in some cases for some instruments as well. And the, the, the overall cadence, you know, the, it's remarkable that a physics project can, you know, look as far out as they do, but um, chemistry and a lot of other projects, you know, are both in their, in their planning and their execution necessarily gonna be much shorter, right? So uh, I'd be open to arguments to the contrary, but, uh, to me, that implies a greater need for people at computing centers to fill in the parts that can be there, right? Rather than watch people, you know, watch, watch a, a large number of small teams try to reproduce solutions that um, without the benefit of that prior work. So I guess this is a way of saying that, that um, this shortening part means that, that um, computer centers should do more, not less. Okay, that's the general um, thesis right there. And then the, the remaining parts, I wanted to sort of um, take some time to, to fill in the, the details. So this is, who, who knows where this is? Who knows what it did? <laughs> I'd love that, that would be a cool bathtub, yeah. You shouldn't put a lid on it. <laughs> okay. So this is an analog uh, DAC uh, for when people figured out that there was something screwy going on with matter, that there was antimatter. Um, they they make pictures like this, and then they hire grad students with the compass to uh, measure the radius, you know, and then from there take, take the, the, that data into a calculation. So we're talking about photographic media, uh, emulsion media, uh, like real photographs, <laughs> uh, and um, and a, a growing need to push throughput on the display. Um, so the, the, the short answer to this is this uh, wonderful paper that the Huff uh, uh, trans transformation 
and you know it's ancient and nothing like the technologies that we're looking right now. But if you fill in the, the sort of sequence of resources and, and concerns, you know, along the way, um, they they really are sort of pushing a data pipeline from photos of of let's call them circles. You know, they're not circles. That's important. Um, but these kind of circular objects into numbers. Um, and this is all done in these cloud chambers, as I mentioned. Um, there are no bits here, but this is kind of what the, the workflow, you know, looks like from that, that patent. And it's, it's a good read, not that you need to fill in the details of what a vertical line, variable line generator are or whatever, but what they're doing is, is they're, they're automating a workflow, you know, from the, the very beginning of how the, how the data is produced to how the model comes out at the end. Uh, no bits. And, you know, well, I'll, I'll come back to this because the hub transformation is also in the LCLS work. But, um, you know, if you want to understand how this works, is taking a picture and any place that you find a pixel, let's call pixels the black. Um, any place you find a pixel um, that is consistent with a line being through that point, then you just vote in the model space for there being a line in that point. Um, you can do the same thing with circles. You can do it with other other sort of things. So it's a scalable voting procedure. Um, and um, these are the types of things that DAX can can do realistically, um, and um, or or the you know the the whether it's at the data acquisition system or or before it gets to us certainly, um, and uh, you know that that. Uh, we'll see the hop transformation is used in the CS pad detector uh, in a little bit for the uh, the work with LCLS. But you know, I very much promote people to think people who are working in data pipelines to think about scalable voting procedures that that don't have to reduce data even necessarily, but qualify data as it marches its way towards towards uh, where where we have to deal with it. Yeah. So that's an example, look kind of somewhat local example from the past. Um, but the, the issues with, um, you know, big teams and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, big science and big teams versus big science and small teams, you know, are, are numerous and show up here. Um, the, uh, you know, we're, we're obliged to work with everybody, I'm trying to say here, you know, but realistically, you know, the, this is, is not, not going to be something where people, sit, two people sit down and then operate this whole, you know, orchestrated thing where, they know how to make the DAC work, and they know how to make the network work. They know how to make the HPC work. There's this HPC is down, and they know how to move this over to another HPC. Um, this is is far from uh, the case, um, but it doesn't need to be the case because many many people will be satisfied and thrilled. In fact, you know if it works um, mostly and and in the in the right sort of circumstances. So this is, is an example where, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Stanford or uh, uh, the LCLS, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, 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 cryoelectron microscopy and some other examples. But I wanted to give people who don't uh, have the background uh, with a, a quick sort of background. Uh, the motivation for doing this is you can you can look at things like photosynthesis, big floppy molecules that you can't crystallize. You can catch them in the act of doing stuff in nature, and um, the uh, the DAC here, for those of you who have seen, we had a, an engineering model downstairs for a long time that, um, that is now back at home. But this is the DAC. And we'll get into sort of how the, how the data moves from being uh, a silicon detector into being something like a file. Um, but this is the overall workflow. And the, the reason for driving it faster is that each of these images contains the same structure that you have here. So the faster you can process those images, the faster you can get that structure. If you can do it within a eight hour shift, that's kind of a breakthrough and that you can then uh, uh, get answers while you're operating rather than take data, stop, understand, take data, stop and understand. So the linkages, um, I'm gonna show two slides. One is, is what we thought we were gonna do. Uh, few years ago, and, and uh, the other is what we think we're gonna do now. But you can see there are a lot of pieces involved. Um, these are the, uh, the clock, you know, from the, the uh, DAC. 
initiates uh, these readout nodes to, um, to build, build event, to communicate to event builder nodes which are ready to write files, essentially. So this is you know, moving things from uh, streaming to, to, store, to files that can be stored. Um, LCLS has a storage layer there. And over in ESNet, we could move data in either through um, a SDN route or through a DTN sort of route into the batch pool where it's been uh, computed. Um, so one, one thing to ask is in this picture, what, what if any of this knows anything about HPC? And um, certainly when we started, these didn't and none of them out there. So that's a, an area of view sort of inside a little bit that is um, ripe for more HPC preparation and planning. This is a uh, more current plan. So some of the, well, I won't get into all the stuff that was wrong with the last uh, study, but um, it, you know, there are a few things that are different here. Um, this is made by Slack, so it certainly reduces us to a <laughs> smaller <laughs> picture here, but that's okay, we're talking about the DAC. <laughs> oh. uh, this is the main thing I wanted us to recognize is that there's now a uh, discussion not of just reading out data, but compressing and reducing data. <coughs> and um, this was an anathema to the project, you know, some years ago, you know, or not. They, they thought that their community would not stand for it, right? that they would want to have all the, all the bits. And so what we've seen is a transition to now the real, realization that there's going to have to be some sort of data compression or some sort of data sensibility that's, that's you know, closer to the eyeball. Is it a block compression? I, so I had heard nothing about lossy compression until just, Jan, until Yana was here. So I don't know who makes that decision or whatever, but um, I, it's not totally decided. So you can see in just a couple of years, you know, the, the overall picture of, of how, how the DAC and the HPC are connected, you know, has, has shifted quite a bit in this, in this particular case. The other slide is out of order, but what I want to show here is that, you know, this is some of the examples of the, the data reduction. And so, um, you know, diffraction is in K space, right? It's in Fourier space. So, you, you know, you, you get things like annula and, and things that, that are boundaries in the physical space that you want to be able to detect. And so, just like in the, in the uh, Sudoku example of using the Huff uh, transform to pick out lines, you could pick out <coughs> and other things here too. So these are the types of things that they're talking about doing that would have happened, well, not here, but they would have happened on a compute cluster somewhere, right? That are now being talked about ha happening uh, before they even get to the compute cluster. Um, so yeah, I, I view that as progress. I mean, maybe it's the maybe it's terrible for their science to lose the bits, but um, it seems like keeping every single one is is uh, difficult. And you can see some of the you know the things that have to be done to deal with the DAC. Um, in, in this case, the detector is fragmented into many different pieces that can be moved, and so you know defragmenting that and dealing with the interstitial spaces is is the important. So that's all about the, the, that, you know, 2017 to 2019, you know, thinking is, is really all about the CS pad detector. And, you know, my, my view of this is, of, of let's say, BES beamline engagement for HPC is that if we kind of regularly go after the, the, the projects that are about to break the network or the computer or whatever, um, those are the ones to chase. And there, there are many here probably not to chase, right? Um, but as, as more and more DACs and more and more methodologies, you know, advance particular, their, their detector rate, you know, the idea that one of these methods could burst out, come to NERSC and say, oh my gosh, you know, our data's on fire, we have a big problem, you know, um, 
ideally, people at NERSC would be well, well prepared to say, hey, cool down, you know? This part, this part of your problem is in, in, the, in the basket, you know, because we can just use it from this other team. And by the way, there's this other part that, that's totally on you and you're gonna have to make that, you know, so. Um, and here's some of those different time frames for that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, BES has some, has some good uh, 2027 plans and things like that at this point. Oh. That animation was unexpected. <laughs> and I need it. <laughs> okay, so that that was all uh, LCLS and X-rays. Um, I didn't talk a lot about ALS there, but that detectorist box and some of the other things that kind of you know can kind of fill in there is that there will be some ones that have these problems. This is a much messier problem, um, and uh, this kind of gets into this, that this is a field that was held back for a long time. Uh, the, the, and then, you know, you see in, 29, in 2017, it was the uh, prize, it was like the method of the year before that. The thing that was holding it back was the data. And that the, the uh, in cryo-electron microscopy, what you do is you, you take things that you can't crystallize, blobs, viruses, stages, things like that, um, and, uh, and you squash them between glass plates and freeze it in a, in a way that the ice does not harm the thing. You know, that you can freeze water in ways that, it, that it's still kind of uh, non-crystalline. And, uh, and then you come in with an electron microscope and look at all those little uh, macromolecular machines that you have in there and you get a blob from each one. And that huge blob that came up that I got rid of was all those little, little shapes. And so these people, are putting some sort of macromolecular uh, fluid, you know, parts in it, uh, into this device, and then collecting, let's say, tens to hundreds of thousands of, of images of what they're hoping is the same thing, you know, but but oh, at different angles. So one one common thing that you'll see through a lot of these these BES things is that a lot of really bad pictures of the same thing are are useful. <laughs> uh, and putting enough of those together turned this from a very speculative fuzzy field into one that's very crisp and sharp. Um, but the current workflow involves picking and refining images on the fly. And this presents a really difficult challenge, um, which I'll, I'll describe a little bit more. Any questions about what is cryo again? Not sure I need this slide, but this is kind of getting about what I was saying before is that, you know, they're getting a lot crisper. Right? And this crispness is from taking a bunch of foggy, fuzzy blobs and, uh, and working with them in the right way. Um, naively, you might think, hey, this looks a lot like a, a, a beamline sort of thing. And so why don't we, you know, just recycle what, we, uh, what we've done from X-ray beamlines. The workflow is very, very different though. And um, this is, a cryo-EM is, is an opportunity both for, for uh, DOE and for NIH, for a lot, a lot of people, um, but whose opportunity it is mostly, um, I'm, I'm still not exactly sure on. And so um, if the cryo-EM field were to change in a way that they were less session driven with two people sitting in a microscope, Kind of working through things and more sort of let's accumulate a large database and chew on it later um things might change but as, as it is right now um you know the, the the compute work and the selection work are very very tied together and so the point at which uh a, a, a cryo person a cryo uh, expert you know often needs to use the supercomputer is when they click on an image when they click on this image when they click on this image. And that is a, um, that's a very difficult thing to schedule. So um, some of the, the discussions there about blending, you know, blending learning from telescope to microscope would be to maybe take the human out of the loop a little bit um, and, uh, or put more humans into the loop in a, in a more uh, in a concerted way. 
um, that makes it less uh, less interactive. And you know, th there's some really encouraging things that are happening here in terms of if you have a bunch of shapes, how can you categorize and search and and organize them? Um, so if anybody has ideas about how to fix the cryoem uh, workflow, I'd be I'm all ears. Uh, yeah, but they're building their own clusters. I mean, th this is one of the things that, that's weird is that their code, they're ready to run, right? So thanks to, uh, largely thanks to a group in the UK, there's a really good CryoEM uh, MPI uh, supported and maintained code, which is fine if, if you have your own uh, HPC system and you just run it on there all the time, but that's, that's not the case. I thought there was like a real-time Easter or some CryoEM stuff. There is, and so this really comes down to, you know, you know, which, which where, where should they use HPC, right? Because if, if they're going to do small stuff in, in a small queue, you know, that's all fine. Um, CryoM has a track record of showing that it can do more with larger data sets. And so in some sense, their future is in larger data. Um, what was I, I thought that I recall that there was a real time queue for some cryo EM stuff that the cryo EM people were doing here at the lab. Oh, but that, um, but I mean, I think you maybe answered it that like, but there is some group that at some point. They, they do, uh, so there are a couple of cryo EM groups that do make good use of the real time interactive small queues, right? But mostly I'm, I'm thinking about things that could use a substantial fraction of the machine. Are they using that? Yeah, I, I think there's like one other out there, but but right. um, okay. almost all of it. It's called rely on is the code. Uh, okay. And and maybe you're thinking I have set up reservations for people on a cryos machine um, that didn't work very well because you know they were all clicking on their particles, <laughs> you know. So so yeah, trying trying things and seeing if they work is is good too. Anybody, like I said, just find them chained together. There's the case studies you're presenting. It does seem to be a theme that uh, there's a person who's designing the DAX, obviously quite well the technology, they create this cool thing. But maybe they don't have a long term perspective on how the data is stored, how it's managed, who's going to analyze it. Well, when, when, I, when, when I say externalized cost, I had a really interesting conversation with this uh, de Detectrix guy uh, up there because he wants to sell devices. You know the downstream consequences of data are not 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 in their you know ballpark. So I think there are different solutions to this, but um, planning, getting ahead of the game, I think is is really uh, the best. You know whether or not we can influence a vendor or other things like that. Uh, not clear. But. So, so I guess who do you think should enforce? Process. Okay, so so that you know, my, I had a plug earlier about get involved in the DMP, right? You know that writing a, a, a DMP is a data management plan, and it, it's 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 a fairly loosey goosey commitment to what you're going to do with your data. That is a newish requirement in DOE work, but better to have some kind of plan than nothing, right? And so, one way to get ahead of the game is to say we're going to state that plan in the in the DMP. And in, in well, not in any cases really, but one could imagine a case that um, <clears throat> you can use it, a proposal in much the same. Well, um, you can use a proposal much the way that you'd use a contract vehicle um, to make sure that uh, one of the parties, you know, is is going to be working on that that part of it. Or whatever. We do that all the time in procurements. So. Okay, so um, my last thing on cryo EM is if you know how to change the workflow, let me know. You know, I, I, otherwise I think that my, my, my imagination has that community kind of <clears throat> crashing up against data issues, maybe moving to some sort of asynchronous helps us have a model or something like that. But as it stands, it's very hard to schedule. 
All right, so the, the next example is, uh, is also about how to connect a weird instrument to, to HPC, but this is in this uh, co-design uh, 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 arena. And so um, this is Ashwin, and this is the 40 stem deck. Oh, I, I couldn't find in my photo book, but it's really cool. That this is a deck that has the nurse logo on it. So, um, the logo will not fix all the issues, <laughs> right? But it, it's at least a, like a memory that this thing is connected to a supercomputer or whatever, you know, that, that I think uh, outreach works in many ways. Uh, okay, so this project started as in a DMP, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, has, has, has marched along the, in a variety of ways. It was uh, really underthought on my part um, not being a networking expert um, and the kind of two, but the networking experts have gotten involved and have, have, have uh, looked at this opportunity, which is that because this is a short, you know, two kilometer hop between the, the back and, and the HPC, um, one could imagine that all of this is very cheap kind of thing because it's not going through telcos or other things like that. And, um, and it still may be. Um, the general model is that um, the, the 40 stem will still get a scan, um, maybe 100 gigabytes, um, and then want to, to analyze that. Um, I suppose the worst thing they could do is produce an instrument that did none of the data analysis. It just like, that's somebody else's problem, right? And, and really what we want to encourage them to do, and, and they want to do too, is figure out which parts of that can be moved back into the into the DAC, right? That 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 make the data higher quality, um, and uh, and 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 make the instrument more usable too. Um, so so uh, one of the issues that we ran into, and this is this is one that may go away, but it's worth uh, worth putting in your bucket of things that can go wrong. You know, is that this is talking a different language on the on the HPC side and networking wise on an Aries interconnect than it is on this side. And so the translation here, much like we've run into before with file formats, right, where everything can connect, but the time that it takes to convert a net CDF to a whatever, you know, is 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 the is the rate limiter. So in this case, the uh, transition from Ethernet to Aries uh, became <coughs> bottleneck to, to, to doing what they want to do. And uh, the solution to that is that the, the, there are two solutions. One is that these FPGA modules are getting uh, smarter. They're getting buffers. They're getting, uh, I would call it a DTN, but they're getting the ability to, to, to store data beyond, you know, the next packet that they need to send out. So. This looked a little more genius before when, when these things are just super dumb, or I mean, super small. And, and the computer could just go out and, and grab them. Um, partly because of this, I could say mostly because of this, these are becoming more like DTM, six of them. Uh, one to one is, is nearly ready. And so this is gonna look more like a, a, a file, you know, a host to host type of thing um, as it comes out. So that's solution number one. And solution number two is, is that if we're all using ethernet, then maybe this problem goes away. Um, Shane laughs. Do you, do you think that, is that unrealistic you think or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shane, is that problem going away in this whole show? I mean, a lot of the, some of the problems are just like these weird kind of, it's like, When we deploy slingshot on global, will that problem still be there? I don't think so. I think it will. If it, if it is there, yeah. I would like people who are smarter than me about networking to build a hole into the machine that works the way it should, right? Um, yeah. Okay. And um, the last things I want to say are fairly, fairly general. So um, where, where is this going? Uh, those two solutions. Yeah. Um, 
So one way to think about DAX is, is edge computing devices, and this fits into our uh, kind of spectrum of ways that we, we deal with um, with data and the resources that they need. Um, and so I put this in in part to say anybody working at computing at the edge, that can mean a lot of different things. Um, the HPC computing at the edge has a specific flavor of things that, you know, are basically favors that could be done for the, the betterment of the downstream HPC uh, data analysis. Um, all of these workflows benefit from automated resource allocation. We're not done there, but there's, there's quite a lot of progress, you know. Uh, uh, one thing I, I think about is the number of people that it takes per run or something like that, you know, to, to do the allocation, um, to be able to, to uh, step into a reservation, um, you know, and all of that. And so, you know, for LCLS, that's about three, three people, two to three people now. And that's, that's not automated, but it's, it's way better than, than 10. Um, and of course, DSEG does user engagement too. So um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of ways that we can um, get involved uh, before people get surprised. That's it. Thanks. So, oh, any questions? Yeah. Traditional has been a feature that the data acquisition is. So that you can keep taking data even if your data processing center is down and you can keep processing your data even if your instrument is having trouble. So it, it seems like you're kind of arguing that these should be more tightly coupled and that makes me nervous unless you actually need to do the processing and get an answer back 